I have the pleasure today to introduce um, Professor Heyer to you before we turn the time over for him to speak. Uh, Professor Heyer has a lot of credentials. He earned a PhD at Columbia University, has studied not only at um, a university in Taiwan, but also at a university in ja Japan. He speaks Chinese fluently and pretty good Japanese, as he's always talking to me in Japanese. Um, that's the area of the world that I deal with. Uh, he was a graduate of Brigham Young University back in 1979. Um, currently, he teaches in the political science department here at BYU. Um, his specialty is international relations and specifically um, issues that have to do with China. So he teaches a variety of courses in international relations and then relating to Chinese politics. His research interests, I'm, the one I'm most familiar with is uh, he's one of the experts in this country on Chinese boundary disputes and has written extensively on that topic. But he's also uh, just a general observer of Chinese politics and is um, quite well versed in understanding what's going on in China and the reasons for what's occurring Chinese-U.S. relations. Uh, he's had a couple of honors serving as a Fulbright Scholar in China. He's been a Pew Faculty Fellow in International Affairs at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Um, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Heyer. Thanks, Ray. Ray. Ray is not only a good friend, he's also a great colleague. Um, I'm happy to return to the Kennedy Center and have this opportunity to speak to you today, and um, I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, move through my marks, run my remarks quite quickly, and leave, leave time for discussion um, on on the specific talk, topic of uh, U.S. perspectives on China or other China-related questions you might have. Um, by way of background. Uh, Several months ago, I was, I was asked by a group of Chinese scholars to, to write an article um, attempting to explain why the Chinese view China as we do. And um, they have indicated they've received permission in China to translate this into Chinese. It will eventually be part of a book that will be hopefully published in Chinese uh, in an attempt to uh, help Chinese uh, students and scholars understand American perspectives on China. Uh, with that thought in mind, I uh, uh, set about writing this article, and uh, so what you will hear today is, is some points taken from that larger article. Um, China uh, oftentimes uh, is not paid attention in to until it uh, hits the front pages of the newspaper, and for, for a number of months now, China has kind of been on the back pages because of other concerns about uh, the war on terrorism and the war in Iraq. But nevertheless, uh, China uh, remains uh, critically important to the United States, uh, uh, critically important to global peace and global cooperation. China is uh, one of the United States' major trading partners. We uh, unfortunately have a $103 billion trade deficit with China in 2002, and it continues to grow. It's the largest trade deficit we have with any country. China and the United States both possess nuclear weapons, and we have very large conventional armies. Uh, the potential to do great destruction around the world. We also share the responsibilities as permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Um, on the front pages today, uh, and one of the things that makes China so important at this moment in time, is that we, we currently share a serious challenge uh, over North Korea and the North Korea nuclear crisis. Um, a high-level Chinese official just returned from Korea, North Korea, uh, yesterday, and, and we have been closely consulting with the Chinese on how to move forward and hopefully peacefully solve the North Korean nuclear crisis, which many people think has taken us very close to war. On other areas, of course, the United States and China must cooperate in combating uh, global terrorism, uh, organized crime, trafficking in, in, in humans, and drug trafficking. And we also need to cooperate on important environmental issues, uh, global warming concerns, uh, global energy issues, and global trade. 
Whether we uh, like it or not, China and the United States are tied together because we are two of the major uh, powers in the world and we share uh, great responsibilities to, to lead the world. However, both nations are increasingly wary of each other and wary of each other's power. The, uh, quote, rise of China alarms many Americans uh, for many reasons that I'll, that I'll detail as I uh, work through my remarks today. On the other hand, uh, U.S. hegemony uh, as the only superpower in the world and the, uh, what appears to be, what appears to many people around the world, the U.S. effort to dominate the world is a major concern for the Chinese and a major issue of criticism uh, that we hear from the Chinese. The present differences that we have are both complex and in many cases intractable. Um, many technical issues that we have uh, had differences over in the past were, were, were more easily uh, solved, such as trade issues, a balance of trade questions, intellectual property questions. These are rather technical issues technical questions, and although not easily solved, are, 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 can be reduced to technical solutions. The kind of uh, differences we share with China, with China today are more, more emotional and therefore more intractable. For example, Taiwan and the future of Taiwan, something the Chinese feel very strongly about and the United States feels fairly strongly about also. Issues of human rights and our different concepts of what constitutes uh, human rights and the respect for human rights issues of democracy and, uh, and other liberal values of which we hold close and the Chinese do not share. These are very emotional issues and not easily solved. So the future for uh, U.S.-China relations in many people's eyes is, 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 is one of conflict and disagreement, despite the fact that we must find some way to cooperate together to address other important problems facing us. Um, the history of U.S.-China relations does not give, uh, give us much optimism uh, from some perspectives, but from other perspectives it gives us uh, great optimism. Um, from, in the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, the United States and China were very close allies in the war against Japan. Uh, we were also very close allies with the Soviet Union at that time in our war against Japan. However, when World War II ended, uh, the communists came to power in China, and in the 1950s and the 1960s, the United States and China became deadly enemies, confronting each other uh, in Korea with uh, you know, tens of thousands of people killed, and again, uh, nearly coming to blows in Vietnam in the 1960s as the Chinese supported the North Vietnamese and we supported the South Vietnamese regime. But in the end of the 60s, by the end of the 1960s, um, the United States and China began to cooperate again, tentatively. And throughout the 1970s and 1980s, we, we had fairly close cooperation because we shared a common enemy, the Soviet Union, which China had become increasingly, le le increasingly leery of, and the United States was, of course, in a deadly conflict with. So we shared a common strategic interest in, con in confronting the Soviet Union or uh, containing the Soviet Union. But by the, by, the, by the end of the 1980s, uh, the Soviet Union was collapsing. It collapsed in the early 1990s. China experienced the, the tragic uh, June uh, 4th uh, massacre at Tiananmen Square. And the strategic interests and the common interests which the United States and China shared began to fall away. Uh, and through the 1990s, and now in this new century, we uh, share no common enemy, which we can unite together to fight. And we have, we have become increasingly mutually suspicious of each other's ambitions to, uh, for world leadership or world domination or at least hegemony. Um, based upon this current circumstance of the rise of the dramatic rise of China, the growing power and or unchallenged power of the United States to dominate the world. Um, what kind of vision do people have of the future of U.S.-China relations? Um, that was the challenge I was facing as I tried to work through these ideas, and I, I settled on on four models. Uh, now, here I want to uh, become a little bit more theoretical and a little bit more conceptual, and I hope you can follow along. Uh, I'll try to make it as clearly as possible. But the argument is that um, the way we view China 
is, is deeply rooted in the, in, the major, in the assumptions we make about the nature of the world. And based upon these assumptions that we make about the world, uh, we adopt certain perspectives uh, towards China. And based upon these perspectives, then certain policy decisions uh, are, are, are adopted and consequences follow. So it's important that we closely examine the underlying assumptions and perspectives we have. And I have tried to sort out American perspectives on China into four, four models. First one being the, what, what I would call the structural conflict model. Uh, the structural conflict model, more popularly known as a realist model, is simply uh, a view of international relations based upon realist balance of power perspectives and therefore consequently quite pessimistic about U.S.-China cooperation or, co or pessimistic about the future of U.S.-China cooperation. One of the major uh, scholars in this uh, school of thought uh, today is John, is, uh, John Mersheimer. He recently wrote a book called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, which I require my students to read and would recommend to anybody. But Mersheimer is not a China specialist. He's a specialist in international relations theory. He's a structural realist. And this is what he has to say about China. He says, quote, When China becomes an economic powerhouse, it will almost certainly translate its economic might into military might and make a run for dominating Northeast Asia. Therefore, China and the United States are destined to be adversaries as China's power grows. A sinologist, who special, someone who specializes in the study of China for a number of years, Ross Carroll, who is, uh, comes from Australia but has lived in the United States for, for decades, in a recent book that he wrote called The, China, the New Chinese Empire, uh, he concludes, quote, China expects a showdown with America unless Americans expect unless Americans accept illusion as truth and lie down and roll over. It plans for the strongest military it can afford, and it treats international institutions as decorations behind which power is what really counts the most. Beijing pursues these aims with persistence, a sense of history, and indirect methods. So Ross Terrell is also very pessimistic about the future of U.S.-China relations. To, um, to illustrate and bolster this argument, most of these scholars will all point to several incidents. Most recently, in 1996, the Taiwan Straits crisis, China began lobbying missiles across the Taiwan Straits towards Taiwan. And the United States, under the, this was the Clinton administration, responded by sending two aircraft carrier task force to the area around Taiwan to deter the Chinese from uh, an invasion of Taiwan, if that's in fact what they anticipated or at least to signal them that the United States would not stand idly by while China intimidated Taiwan. Um, Mersheimer, looking at that event, then concludes, quote, a clash between China and the United States over Taiwan is hardly remote. I will say more about Taiwan in a moment. The conclusion of this school of thought, of course, then, is that we must contain China. We must prevent China from becoming a large economic and therefore military power, and they would suggest that we pursue a policy of containment, at least to delay the rise of China as a challenger to United States domination of the world, if not prevent it. Uh, so it's a very pessimistic view of the future of U.S.-China relations. Um, the next model is uh, what I call a domestic politics model. Um, this, this view uh, argues that uh, domestic politics is what drives any state's foreign policy. So we want to look carefully at the, at the domestic politics within the United States in order to understand U.S. foreign policy. And the same would work for China, but I'm going to look at the U.S. side of, of that equation today. Uh, commonly, we sometimes refer to this as a two-level game. In other words, um, any president or, or, or leader of a nation is really engaged in, 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 in two games. One is a domestic po political game where he must cater to public interests and, and grassroots interests. And uh, the other game is an international game where he tries to uh, uh, manage relationships with, with, with an adversary or with, a, with an ally. And how do you balance that? Sometimes you have to adopt more, uh, more uh, warlike or more aggressive poli foreign policies in order to satisfy some domestic constituents constituency. Um, Seventy percent of the members of Congress and sixty percent of the senators 
have all been elected since the end of the Cold War. This is a dramatic change in the makeup of the American Congress. These senators and congressmen do not share an old, uh, older Cold War consensus that, that the United States must be somehow united in the face of a confrontation or challenge from, some, from a country like the Soviet Union. Um, oftentimes, the administration had a much freer hand during the Cold War because Congress, it was, the, it was the culture of Congress to speak with one voice in foreign policy and unite behind the president to confront this challenge to the United States as we saw in the Soviet Union. However, since the end of the Cold War, this has broken down. Congress is, it, Congress is increasingly critical of the administration's foreign policy and, more importantly, has now strongly asserted an active role in foreign relations, arguing that, that Congress has an important role to play. Um, regarding China, the congressional role is, 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 is both complex but also important and interesting. It doesn't divide evenly along partisan lines, uh, where Democrats are in favor of something and Republicans oppose something. What, in fact, we often observe is that the, the more liberal wing of the Democratic Party and the right wing of the Republican Party are united together in an anti-China policy. The Democrats, the liberal Democrats, are opposed to China because of human rights violations and concern about the export or the loss of American jobs to cheap Chinese labor. Uh, so they're more beholden to labor unions and, 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 and liberal human rights groups. The right wing of the Republican Party uh, is, is controlled by, by, by fundamentalist Christians, uh, and they're opposed to China because of the, uh, uh, the abortion policies in China or lack of freedom of religion and things like that. So the right wing of the Republican Party and the left wing of the Democrat Party can find common cause in opposing China, whereas the moderate Democrats and the moderate Republicans are more interested in economic growth, more interested in, in international cooperation, and therefore they unite together to promote, uh, to promote, to promote China's membership in the World Trade Organization, to promote uh, non-discrimination against China in, 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 in trade issues and things like that, and, and are much more willing to support uh, the presidents, Bush, Clinton, before him, in, in a cooperative uh, relationship with China. Um, but you can see by that example the role of, of congressional opinion in, um, in U.S. foreign policy and the challenges that, the pre that all presidents have faced in trying to pursue a coherent China policy and at the same time not anger uh, important supporters uh, in Congress and certain key groups in Congress. Um, let me put the screen down and turn to uh, public opinion. Uh, according to the domestic politics model, uh, of course, public opinion also plays a role because the, the notion is that, that, that public opinion percolates up to, to congressional and executive leadership and has some influence over the policies they take because, after all, they're driven by, by, by a single desire to be elected and they're willing to pander to public opinion to be reelected. But on the other hand, um, through, um, through the mass media, through, through cable news, major networks, uh, congressional views and, uh, and administration uh, perspectives on foreign policy also influence public opinion. So there's this, this uh, influence works both ways. Um, so I want to look here a little bit at, at public opinion um, and, and somewhat at, at leadership opinion. This data is taken from the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations uh, survey on, on U.S. attitudes towards foreign policy. Uh, the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations conducts this survey every four years, and it goes back for about 12 years, so you can look at changes over time. Um, and this is the 2002 uh, public opinion. It was published early in 2003, so it's very current. Um, This may be my glasses. Um, the first, one of the first questions, they, they asked numerous questions. This survey was just not on China. It was on all kinds of issues. And I, and I gleaned out the ones the, uh, related to my topic in China. Uh, the first question here is, is what we call a thermometer question. You know, uh, uh, you know, zero degrees being cold, 100 degrees being hot. 
what's your feeling towards China? And uh, Americans, you know, the average was 48 degrees. So slightly cool towards China. Now, you know, interesting comparison, uh, they were only slightly warm towards Taiwan, even though sometimes in, in, in public rhetoric, Taiwan is a very important, you know, country uh, or entity for the United States. Um, and, and, and that's what that question um, refers to. So Americans are slightly cool. And that, that has not changed in any significant way since 1989. Before 1989, it was very warm. China was, we were very warm towards China, but since 1989, it became quite cool towards China, or slightly cool. Um, terrorism is a major concern of Americans today, and China is one of our allies, one of our major allies in the war on terrorism. But Americans see, generally, by a small margin, see China as an unreliable ally in the war on terrorism. I, I'd like to know why, and go for further question them on why that's the case, but... Um, that's what the survey shows. Uh, in number three, 83% of Americans believe China is a vital interest to the U.S. Now, vital interest doesn't mean it's, uh, we like China. It's, just, it's a vital interest you know, it's because of its economic power, its military power, etc. This is, this is this China is ranked highest along with uh, a similar, with 83% for Japan and Saudi Arabia. Um, this has risen uh, by, by 12 points since 1998, uh, from 71% in 1998. So Americans see China as increasingly important toward the United States. Now, increasingly important in what way is an interesting question. Part of that other question shows, though, that only 80% of Americans, although 83% think China's a vital interest, only 80% of Americans support having diplomatic relations with China. 20%, I assume, are opposed because it's a communist nation, it's not a free nation, it's something like that. And only 71% favor having normal trade relations with China, reflecting Americans' concern that, that Chinese are taking jobs from America, they're dumping cheap exports onto America, which is distressing the American textile industry and other things. And, and a general kind of protectionist sentiment among the population. Now, 72% believe China will play a greater role in the world over the next 10 years. In other words, China's role is going to increase over the next 10 years, and this is second only to the United States. If Americans felt the United States role would increase the most, but second to that, China would be, play a much greater role over the next 10 years. But 56% believe China will become a critical threat to the vital interests of the United States. Very negative. And if we, can, if we include important threat and criti critical threat, 90% of Americans polled believe that China is, uh, is, is a threat to the United States. And this is a 17% increase since 1994. So Americans see China as a growing power, becoming more important, but also are very pessimistic about how this will affect U.S. vital national interests, with a large number of them seeing it as affecting it very negatively. 53% uh, believe China practices unfair trade. Uh, this is 10% higher than Japan. So now, now where, where Japan used to be the bad trade partner, now China has become the bad trade partner. And they're more unfair in trade with the United States than Japan in the perceptions of Americans. 51%, uh, so which is just barely, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a barely a majority, uh, support imposing economic sanctions on China as a tool of foreign policy. In other words, if we don't like their human rights, if we don't like their their uh, family planning policies, if we don't like their uh, religious liberty policy, we should use our economic power to leverage China. And this was something that, that past administrations opted not to do. It was a very popular policy with Congress and generally with Americans. But uh, from the Bush, first Bush administration to the Clinton administration to the second Bush administration, all of them have opted uh, not to use economic sanctions as a leverage against China for other issues like, such as human rights or Taiwan. And now China, in fact, was uh, at, the, at the very end of the Clinton administration was given, uh, was granted permanent normal trade relations. And so we do not, we cannot, according to law now, link economic trade with issues such as human rights uh, to gain leverage against China. Now, uh, as you might imagine, uh, the left wing of the Democratic Party and the right wing of the Republican Party were unhappy about this policy because they wanted to be able to use trade to leverage China on freedom of religion or abortion or human rights or labor rights or something like that. But the mainstream of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party favored a normal trade relation with the United States, seeing it as good both for China in the long term and for the United States. 
Um, now, the issue of Taiwan, which I know interests many of you. 65% believe Taiwan is a vital interest to the United States. In other words, not as important to the United States as, as China, but nevertheless a vital interest to the United States. However, only 32% of the Americans were willing to stand up and fight for Taiwan by sending U.S. troops if Taiwan is attacked by mainland China. This is only an increase of 5% since 1998. So Americans, while they like Taiwan, they think Taiwan is important to the United States, they think Taiwan is a great democratic country, they're not willing to go fight and die for Taiwan. It's not that important to the United States. Um, I guess the assumption is we'd still enjoy great trade with Taiwan, even if it was controlled by the communists. It really hasn't changed Hong Kong dramatically. And, of course, and a, a large majority, 58%, would strongly oppose the commitment of U.S. troops if Taiwan was attacked by mainland China. So while we talk tough about Taiwan and we send aircraft carriers, public opinion would never support the president in sending U.S. troops to die to save Taiwan from a, an attack by mainland China. Now, in the same survey, he did survey uh, congressional leadership and, and, and administration leaders. Uh, 64% of 64% of congressional and, and administration leadership feel that China is more important uh, to the vital interests of the United States than Japan. This is a 70% increase since 1998. Only, only 4% of congressional leaders and uh, White House officials felt that China and Japan were equally as important to the vital interests of the United States. So clearly we're beginning to see China as much more important than Japan. However, 47% are concerned that China will become a critical threat to the vital interests of the United States. Um, and 47% believe China will become an important threat to the United States. So, so 94% of our congressional leadership and, and administration leadership feel that China will become a critical or important threat to the United States. That's slightly above what public opinion, what the popular opinion is at 90%. Now, here, I, I put a note here, there's a 9% decline since 1998 but it's a 20% increase overall since 1994. So the, the feeling that China was going to be a threat went, was kind of spiked for a period of time and is backed up a little bit, but it's still 20% higher than it was in 1994. China began to develop dramatically uh, in 1992. It really took off in 1992. Its, its econo economy began to grow very, very rapidly. As a result, its military be budgets began to increase about 17% a year, and congressional concern about China becoming as great uh, military monster in the future began to grow dramatically among congressional leadership, White House leadership, as well as among popular opinion. A lot of books now are published, you know, on you know the coming crisis with China, sort of pseudo journalistic academic books that talk about that. That used to be the popular genre for Japan, you know, but now it's China. Novels oftentimes concoct, you know, conflict between China and the United States. Movies and things tend to portray China as, uh, as, as, as a bad guy in many cases. So popularly and officially, the United States is concerned about uh, the growing power that China has. Congressional people, though, uh, are a little bit more realistic, I believe, and only 28% favor using economic sanctions as a, as a tool of foreign policy, where it's 51% of the popular opinion. Um, so uh, the government is quite reluctant to use uh, economic sanctions against China. They see it as, as shooting ourselves in the foot. And a slightly higher percent, I shouldn't say slightly higher, it's actually significantly higher percent of U.S. government officials favor sending troops to Taiwan if it's attacked. 54% as a, compared to, to uh, 31% of uh, the general public. Or 32%, excuse me. So uh, there, there would be an interesting development if, if China makes a military move against uh, Taiwan, uh, what, what kind of public opinion and what kind of debate there will be between Congress, uh, public, and the administration over what, what, what response the United States should take. It's, a, it's a, an eventuality that I would hate to see come about simply because it would be such a difficult decision to stand by and watch Taiwan, a, a vibrant democratic nation, be taken over by mainland China. But on the other hand, is it really uh, in the United States' interest to sacrifice uh, your brothers and sisters uh, to defend Taiwan, a country we don't even recognize. Now, one of the problems that we we face now 
in terms of, of domestic politics and its influence over foreign policy is um, what I call the, the, the death or the retirement of the old stewards of U.S.-China relations. Uh, I'm thinking in terms here of, uh, on the American side of Nixon and Henry Kissinger and to some degree also George Bush Sr. And on the Chinese side, of course, uh, Mao Zedong, who is dead, and uh, Deng Xiaoping, who is now dead. These people uh, played a crucial role in U.S.-China relations in the late 1960s and early 1970s in managing U.S.-China relations. They had, they had credibility within their countries. They had political clout within their countries. And were able to uh, make some very difficult decisions that, uh, that I personally believe served the interests of both the United States and China. Um, however, the leadership in China now is a young leadership with very little foreign policy experience and can never, can probably not take any bold moves when bold moves are necessary because they are concerned about their own political survivability and the, the neophyte administration we have with uh, President Bush, I mean, I can't imagine that he could do, pull anything off like Nixon was able to pull off and bring the American public around to recognizing China when it was still a communist country. Um, so we're in a period of time in both countries where we have a new, new, younger, inexperienced leadership, and when major challenges come our way, um, uh, some people have a lot of concern about how well we'll manage those challenges. Um, this, therefore, the domestic political, domestic politics model sees conflict on the horizon. Maybe we're not currently in conflict. They see conflict on the horizon. And this is uh, furthermore exacerbated by the fact that China is an authoritarian country. Part of the domestic politics model is, uh, is a belief in what we call democratic peace. The argument that democratic nations are more peaceful, and as nations become more democratic, they become more peaceful. So the concern is China is not a democratic nation. And as it becomes militarily more powerful, but maintains an authoritarian political system, it will become a more aggressive nation. Um, and that, all, that view, then, of China becoming a military, military power and authoritarian at the same time is something that uh, uh, makes many people pessimistic about the future of U.S.-China cooperation or the, and the potential for conflict between China and the United States in the future. Um, the third model is the is a transnational relations model. The transnational relations model, meaning is a model which de-emphasizes the central role of government in mediating U.S.-China relations, but rather looks to non-government organizations, churches, academic institutions, uh, humanitarian groups, etc. Uh, in, in mediating relations between two countries. The argument being that, that non-government organizations uh, have come to control uh, and have greater control and influence over the relations between two nations, and in this case, specific relations between the United States and China. Um, in other words, interest groups within the United States and interest groups within China cooperate together and coordinate their policies to put pressure on, their, on each side's government to make certain changes. In other words, business interests in China completely agree with business interests in the United States that we should have free, free and open trade. And so they will lobby their governments to, to, uh, to uh, get China into the World Trade Organization. They'll lobby their governments to solve, these, solve some nettlesome problems over trade. Human rights groups on both, in both countries will also pursue coordinated policies to try to improve or pressure the Chinese government to improve, improve human rights. Scholars will work together to improve intercultural communication and scholarly exchange, and on and on and on. So in other words, there's, there's a vast number of organizations and groups and clubs that are not under the control of government, but yet are in, intimately involved in foreign relations. Um, my relationship with my Chinese colleagues in the past was, was quite controlled and mediated by the Chinese government. They could, they could say whether I could go to China or not by withholding or granting a visa. They could, they could, they could, not, they could permit, prevent me excuse me, from visiting certain scholars or officials that I wanted to interview, even if they wanted to meet with me. That has all changed. I can go to China. I can call people on the phone. I can call them on their cell phone or beep them on their beeper. I can meet them anywhere I want. We can talk about what we want. I can email back and forth with them, and we can exchange information freely and without the control of the government. 
And increasingly, things like the World Wide Web and everything are very important uh, in connecting the world without the control of the government, out from under the control of the government. And that is going to have some kind of positive effect upon U.S.-China relations, this school of thought would believe, in developing common understanding among people, which will then pressure their governments to seek cooperation rather than conflict, solve problems peacefully. So the World Wide Web connects the world. Now, to give you an ex- two specific examples quickly, uh, business groups in both China and the United States strongly uh, lobbied their governments to the World Trade Organization, even though many groups were not, did not want that to happen. Um, and also the most recent uh, SARS uh, example is, is, makes this clearly true, where, where World Health Organizations and groups of doctors, uh, you know, doctors, uh, sans frontiers, doctors who are interested in international health issues, began cooperating closely together and to, some, to quite a great degree out of the control of government to, to, to address a mutual problem. Uh, this is the this same kind of efforts are going on in terms of AIDS prevention and AIDS education and things like that. Um, so the transnational relations model uh, assumes that globalization is driving transparency and openness in international relations, and this leads to greater cooperation, and popular and societal interest groups can constrain their government uh, from doing things which will hurt them. Um, now, this raises an interesting question about Taiwan. Uh, do America, does the American public generally believe that we benefit more from normal trade relations with China and free exchange of ideas and people. And therefore, would we then pressure our our government not to take any military action against China if they were to invade Taiwan? Because as a people, we have made a calculation that our own economic interests and benefits in having good relations with China outweigh some emotional attachment we have to Taiwan. And therefore, we don't want to sacrifice our China relationship to save Taiwan. Now, Popular opinion in the United States is, more, is much more reluctant to use military force to save Taiwan from an attack by mainland China than the government opinion. So when push comes to shove, will our understanding, human rights groups, peace movements, business groups, will they say, look, it, we're having a good relationship with China. Let's not muck that up by sending American troops to lose their lives in Taiwan for the sake of defending a nation that's democratic, yes, Openly, uh, open society, yes, but nevertheless, not as vitally interest, not a, not such a vital interest to the United States as China is now because of its size and its economy and things. So that's something to consider. Now, the final school of thought is what we call the complex interdependence model. Um, they they take a global perspective on international um, relations. Um, are interested in, in the effect of interdependence upon international relations and, 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 and generally uh, uh, accept a school of thought that we would call liberalism or neoliberalism. The idea that increased trade uh, between nations helps nations become t- establish bonds that are hard to break because uh, it's in our interest to have these ties. We begin to share common understandings of international norms and principles. We, we have common support for international institutions such as the World Trade Organization or the United Nations or the World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera. So this common stake in the international community, you know, buttressed by trade and development, etc., strengthens our ties, and these ties bind us together and therefore make us much more likely to seek peaceful solutions to problems and conflicts rather than resort to war. The economic transformation in China has made China a much more vital interest to the United States. Uh, Our bilateral trade every year is worth $150 billion. That has doubled in the last five years, by the way. And some estimates say that 200,000 high-paying American jobs are tied to China trade. Aircraft, aerospace industry, high technology and things. China is a major market for the United States where we have a comparative advantage. And some people think about 200 American, 200,000 American jobs would be, would be hurt if this trade was broken off. In other words, the web of interdependence is too costly to break. 
this gives us an important incentive to cooperate and seek mutually acceptable solutions to problems. Two examples I can give you. In 1999, in May of 1999, the United States bombed the uh, Chinese embassy in Belgrade by accident. It's hard to convince the Chinese of that, but, um, but I'm assuming that was the case. Um, and in, and in April 1st of 2001, um, we had a spy plane that uh, was intercepted by a Chinese aircraft, and they eventually bumped. And the Chinese plane went down in flames over the South China Sea, and of course the American, American crew was uh, landed in, in Hainan Island, was uh, there for a couple of weeks before they were taken out of China. Now, both of those incidents, a bombing of a Chinese embassy, it, bombing the Chinese embassy in Belgrade is, is the equivalent of bombing China because it's a sovereign territory of China. And then a confrontation over the South China Sea with these air force, with these planes. In, in years gone by, it could have easily been an incident to provoke a war. Remember, it was, just, it was only the assassination of an Archduke that started World War I. You know, an Archduke of Hungary. Um, and you can imagine during the Cold War if something like this had happened, how easily war could have come about. But the Chinese, and I give them a lot of credit for this, and the Americans both, carefully managed these crises. We backed down from those, con those potential conflicts uh, quickly and with great skill, and we avoided serious confrontations. And relations went along quite normally after a couple of weeks of hand-wringing. Um, to, to underline that point, um, the, um, the um, spy plane incident happened April 1st of 2001. Uh, the World Trade Centers were bombed on 9-11, on September 11th of 2001. And on September 25th, 14 days later, President Bush went to China. The first foreign visit after the 9-11 incident, he went to China. And he and Jiang Zemin appeared after their meetings declaring common front in the war on terrorism. So we clearly understood the importance of China in a war on terrorism, and we put the spy plane incident behind us very quickly and moved forward in a common cause against terrorism. Now, the conflict interdependence model then, of course, as I think you can tell, uh, is very optimistic about the future of U.S.-China relations. We see it will improve as our mutual interests and institutional ties grow. Um, as China is more exposed to international trade and things, economic liberalism will play its uh, role in China, and China will become increasingly democratic politically, and therefore it will become less threatening to the United States. And therefore, those who accept the complex interdependence model generally also urge what, a policy of what we call constructive engagement uh, with China, where we do not let political irritants get in the way of uh, economic relations, and other important uh, relationships relating to environmental issues, terrorism, uh, international drug trafficking, and things like that. Uh, political irritants will come and go, but we need to help them come and go quickly, as we did with the embassy bombing and the spy plane incident, so that we can push forward on the important issues that tie us together. Um, so this school of thought is fairly optimistic about a, a positive future. Now, that's a quick run through those schools of thought. I see that I've gone over a little bit, than I, more than I wanted, but I, I've left a few minutes for, for question and answer. So I'll end my remarks there and, and entertain any questions you might have. Yes, Lee? Oh, well, that's clearly the argument of constructive engagement, is on this foundation of good economic relations and trade, which are, by the way, you know, China's one of our number one trading partners. We can, upon that foundation, build in other areas where we can overcome more politically sensitive and difficult questions, because we see the enormous economic benefit to good relations. And, and on the side of that is people who adopt that school of thought believe that not only is economic trade good for us in an economic sense, but that trade with China will have a dramatic effect on changing Chinese, the Chinese political system, and China over time will gradually liberalize and open their political system because that becomes necessary in order to pursue 
further economic development. That's what I'm thinking, not so much the corruption. Well, yeah. That's the way American politicians sell this to the American public, is that, look, we're not just getting economic benefit now, but in the future there'll be a payoff of uh, the emergence of a liberal democratic political system in China, and then China will not be threatening to it. This relates also to that domestic politics school of thought that, uh, that uh, accepts the democratic peace argument, The democratic states are more peaceful. This is a footnote. There's a big debate about that. But Would you please wait until I bring the microphone to you? Yes. Yeah. Well, they're, they're not, let, let me say they're full participants. They're very full participants. Uh, they are as uh, frustrated with North Korea as we are, I think. Uh, we have very different opinions on how to solve the problem, and I think that's where the, uh, the, the, the genesis of your observation is that we, we portray them as less cooperative. The Chinese do not want to pressure the, pressure the North Korean regime to the point where it would collapse. Uh, they would then experience this enormous refugee problem and great instability in, in Northeast Asia, so they want to take kind of a soft approach. Nevertheless, they have spoken very clearly to the North Koreans uh, in the last few days even and have openly and publicly said they are, they are 100% opposed to a nuclear-armed peninsula and that the North Koreans must enter into some kind of negotiation to solve this problem, whereas the United States, on the other hand, seems a, will, a little more willing to push and, and some people in the administration, I think, that would actually like to push hard enough to, to topple the North Korean regime and then pick up the pieces after. Um, you know, if that happened, I may be picking up the pieces would be a little bit easier than it's proved to be in Iraq. But um, the Japanese are sort of stuck in the middle here. They, they see the problem. The South, South Koreans, are, 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 they're the ones that are really, uh, you know, very, very concerned. Large demonstrations opposing the use of force because... Um, you know, if war breaks out, uh, this was an estimate during the Clinton administration when he anticipated attacking uh, North Korea in 1994. Uh, a military estimate estimated that in the first 60 days of such a conflict, there would be about 60,000 American lives lost and millions of Korea, South Korean lives lost because North Korea has one of the largest armies in the world. So this is a difficult problem, and it illustrates, again, how important it is that we cooperate with the Chinese and China will become a facilitator of some kind of a meeting in Beijing eventually, uh, some kind of four-power or five-power meeting involving the Chinese, North and South Korea, Japan, the United States, and even Russia, to come to some kind of multilateral slash bilateral solution. North, South Koreans want, the North Koreans want bi, bi, bilateral negotiation, the United States refuses. And the Chinese are trying to facilitate it. Um, China is one of the few countries that the North Koreans have relations with, and, and I think somewhat trust. But if you, if you read Chinese internal documents, uh, they are extremely frustrated with North Korea and, and, and their intelligence on North Korea is probably not that much better than ours. It's such a closed society. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Just behind you and then we'll come this way. And in China. Much China is enjoying some success now because they well, it's not the communist model that's been enjoying success. It's the liberal economic model. Is that going to continue? Will there be some sort of evolution away from the communism to yeah. something else? Uh, like I, I think so. I, I think so. You know, we're moving to what now we could characterize as a, as a soft authoritarian state, where in the past it was a totalitarian state, some kind of a soft authoritarian state. Remember that it wasn't uh, that long ago, not really more than much more than a decade, two decades ago, that, that South Korea was a very authoritarian state. Taiwan was a very authoritarian state, and both of them pursued a model of economic liberalization, which eventually led to democratically elected governments, and Taiwan now is a very democratic state, directly electing their president with a very vibrant, open, free press, and, and this only began uh, about 15 years ago with the end of martial law and beginning to back away from, a, from an authoritarian military dictatorship. Um, so, yes, in China that could happen, too. Now, does that take one decade, two decades, one generation, two generations? I think that's anybody's guess. I can't predict that any, any better than a seismologist can predict the next earthquake, but probably just about as good as they can. I don't know. Sometime in the future. And so we're optimistic. And that buttresses this, this, uh, 
the, the um, complex interdependence model argument that, that even though China is communist and it violates human rights and it doesn't have freedom of religion, we need to continue to trade with them because on the premise of this open trade, we'll gradually leverage their society into a more open democratic society. And China has dramatically changed. China, Chinese enjoy greater levels of human rights and freedom today than they ever have in the past. I mean, you know, the Cultural Revolution was a disaster for Chinese, and they recognized that. Up and through 1978, it was still very bad. But Chinese today can freely work and live where they want. They can travel abroad freely. Chinese don't complain about not being able to leave China. They complain about not, the United States not giving them visas to come to this country. That's the problem. <laughs> we don't let them come here. They'd love to, and their government will let them, but that's the problem. And freedom of religion is increasing. With under, under serious constraints, but still increasing. Yes, go ahead. Two-part question. Um, if and when will China attack Taiwan in order to you know, put them back into the communist fold? And if they do it in the near future, um, like the next couple of years, uh -huh. do you see America taking the um, domestic policy approach of uh, going into Taiwan or the transnational relations approach? Of well, um, gosh, you know, if I could tell you when, if and when China would attack Taiwan, I, I could probably get a good job someplace. Um, <laughs> let me just say that the potential for conflict in Taiwan is, is enormously high. Uh, Chinese, nearly to a person, are very, very united behind the idea that Taiwan is part of China, historically has been part of China, and it should become reunited with the motherland. It was taken away from China by Japanese imperialism, etc. That is a story or a narrative that you're not going to get them to change. Um, only a few Chinese now are beginning to think that, gosh, you know, is it really that important? Um, Hong Kong's off the radar screen now. It's kind of on for other reasons now. Hong Kong's off the radar screen. Macau's off the radar screen. Taiwan's sort of top on the on the list now for for the reunification of the of the motherland uh, and overcoming the effects of, of imperialism in China. Um, Taiwan, the Taiwan side of the equation is much more complicated. Public opinion in Ta Taiwan is is changing all the time. Increasingly, Taiwanese see themselves as Taiwanese and not Chinese. Some see themselves as Taiwanese and Chinese. A small number of people see themselves only as Chinese. And those people generally support the, 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 the new party and the old Kuomintang party, the Nationalist Party, and are in favor of reunification with the motherland. The new parties that control the government, the Democratic Progressive Party and the, and the, and the Taiwan Forum, which is Li Denghui's, the Taiwan Solidarity Union, which is Li Denghui's group, are, are moderately to radically in favor of independence. And the United States is in a dilemma. We want to tell the Taiwanese, don't declare independence. If you do, you're on your own. And we want to tell the Chinese that if they do declare independence and you attack, we might have to do something. We are, this is one of the most difficult problems the United States has because we, do, we want to send a signal to the Chinese that they should not attack and they should peacefully resolve the problem. And we want to send a signal to the Taiwanese that they better not declare independence, that we have a three-no policy. We do not support Taiwanese independence. We do not support Taiwan's membership in the, world, in, the internet, in the United Nations. And we do not support Taiwan's membership in other international organizations which require state status. We diplomatically do not recognize Taiwan. But we sell them arms, we trade with them. So it's a problem. Uh, well, as the survey says, you know, 32% of the American, only 32% only of the American people would favor sending your brothers and sisters to Taiwan to defend Taiwan. 58% would strongly oppose. I'm not sure where I stand when push comes to shove. I just hope we don't have to face that eventuality. And over time, the Chinese, the Chinese in Taiwan and mainland China will work this problem out. I personally don't have an opinion. Whether, if Taiwan is part of China and that's what they want to be, that's fine with me. Some people have an axe to grind and think that Taiwan should always be independent. I have many Taiwanese friends that feel strongly that way. My response is, 
it's not my problem, it's your problem, and you better work it out with the Chinese on the mainland, or else you guys are going to start killing each other. And the specter of Chinese killing Chinese is something that you should think about before you start doing it. So that's my view. Yeah. Oh, here. Enumerated there is a complication. When I first uh, began raising my hand, I said, okay. Well, these people are all Chinese and reluctant to uh, take stronger action against Taiwan, likely because they value our trade. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's important to them. And they realize, and, and we are on the, clearly on the record that, that um, it will be costed to them economically and politically if they, if they make a military move against Taiwan. They clearly know that. And there's the, there's the real possibility that the United States will take military action to present it, prevent it. So what we give Taiwan is an insurance policy. We sell arms to Taiwan, and we tell the mainland Chinese, the reason why we sell arms to Taiwan is because you continue to threaten them. If you stop threatening Taiwan, and you publicly state that you will not use force to solve this problem, we may be able to find a way out of giving them, sell, selling them arms, and you guys can work this problem out. But as long as you threaten Taiwan, rhetorically or in action, with you know, missile batteries along the coast and things, we will continue to sell arms to Taiwan as an insurance policy. Now, one of the best insurance policies Taiwan has right now is the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, because many people think the Chinese will never do anything until after the 2008 Olympics, because they don't want to replay the Moscow 1980 Olympics. Remember, those Olympics were canceled because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So people in Taiwan were quite happy to see mainland Beijing get the 2008 Olympics. <laughs> Let me come to this side. Here's, here's a real authority he can see. <laughs> Go ahead. It's kind of sacrament meeting. You have to get the microphone for it. Rachel, right, so I'm probably moving over here. You know, if, if any of you want to get up and leave, this class was officially over at 10 too, but I'll stay here as long as you have questions. So if, if I won't be offended if you need to get up and go to another class or, or lunch or something. I'd just be curious to uh, hear your views on, on what's happening in, in Hong Kong. Uh, the oh, yeah. success of uh, forcing the government to withdraw its uh, Article 23 legislation and and the very real possibility that public protests may force a, a, a highly unpopular leader to step down. Yeah. Uh, boy, you know, Ty, what's going on in Taiwan now is really quite exciting. Uh, you know, July 1st was the six-year anniversary of the return of Hong Kong to mainland China control, and it was celebrated by a demonstration of about 500,000 people, I believe, opposing a, a law that was pending... Uh, in the, in, the, in, the, in the legislative council called Article 23, which was, was an anti-sedition, anti-treason law, which threatened people with uh, life in prison for acts that were considered treasonous or seditious. This was pushed, strongly pushed by uh, Beijing and, and Tong Qihua, uh, Tong, Dong Jianhua, the, the leader of Hong Kong. Um, and, and, and I think that they were all caught off guard by this. I mean, Hong Kong people generally very apolitical. They're worried about the bottom line and things. But boy, this got them going. It was interesting. It was fun. To, it was nice, I should say, to see them come out on July 1st with this huge demonstration. And it forced the government to back down and to, and, and to take this legislation off the table, initially to offer some changes and then take it off the table. And the news this morning says that um, Regina Yip, who is the national security advisor to Tong Chihua, has now has been forced to resign because she's enormously unpopular for pushing this legislation. And this goes on, and now there's been several subsequent demonstrations where they've asked for, the, for to force Hong Chi Hua to step down. He still has about uh, four years left in his term, and I'm doubtful that the Chinese would actually force him to step down. Well, that would really be admitting defeat, but they're probably just scratching their heads on how do we handle this. Uh, you know, I don't follow Taiwan that closely, so I don't really know what's going on, but it, it certainly is a demonstration that the Hong Kong people, when push comes to shove, and, 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 and their civil liberties are threatened by, by Beijing-sponsored and pushed legislation, they will hit the streets. And it shows that, the, that certainly the, the two-system program is working. There's a, something called the One Country, Two Systems program. The Hong Kong is part of China, but it's a separate political system. And, and now the Hong Kong people are emphasizing two systems. Hong Kong people govern Hong Kong. 
and the mainland authorities are, 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 are stressing one country. So it's this conflict between one country and two systems where what's more important, that Hong Kong is part of China, it should sort of follow Beijing's lead, or Hong Kong people govern Hong Kong, and if they don't like this legislation and they want a popularly elected governor general, they should have it. This will be an interesting, uh, this will be interesting to watch play out, but I really don't know where it's going. But whoever dreamed it, Tong Shiwa would have to back down. Yes. Uh, nothing really significant because they, in the past, have had different formulations of that. They've recognized the Tibet region as part of China. They've recognized Tibet as part of China. And this time, they simply used the Chinese phraseology that the Tibetan Autonomous Region is, is an inalienable part of the People's Republic of China. The government was uh, criticized by many people for backing down, but th their response was, we have always recognized that Tibet is part of China, and simply it's a reiteration of a policy using a little different language. The, the interesting side of that, though, is that in, in return for that uh, statement, the Chinese have implicitly recognized that Sikkim is part of India. And in India was taken, Sikkim was taken over by India in 1975, and the monarchy was overthrown. And the Chinese have refused to recognize that. Uh, but now they have, and, and trade bet between Sikkim and Tibet will now open up. There's two major trading, that's a major trading route between Tibet and, and India through the pass that it goes through Sikkim. And those towns will be opened up for trade. So it's a major step forward in cooperation between the Chinese and the Indians. But it's not a major concession by the Indians, nor is it a major concession by the Chinese because uh, Sikkim has been governed as part of India since 1975. Yes, in the back here. I was just wondering how much influence the United States actually has in moving China towards a, a democratic state. So I have noticed there's a lot of uh, human rights rallies and things like that. I was just wondering what kind of role the United States has. Um, my inclination is to say very little. Some on the margin. I mean, there's a dilemma here. I mean, some of these, you know, when, when the United States government officials go over and make representation on behalf of particular individuals or dissidents in China, we do get them out of jail. But, but, the, but the problem with that is, yes, an individual, an individual uh, was, is now free, uh, and that is certainly an enormous change in that individual's life. But in terms of change in the Chinese structure and system of human rights abuses, it, it didn't really make any progress. And, and the United States has, I think, generally now come to the consensus feeling that uh, we have very little impact upon China's fundamental human rights behavior. We can have influence on specific incidents and specific people, but in terms of getting them to change fundamentally, we have little influence. Now, on the other hand, it's important that we have a dialogue, and the Chinese have generally become more willing to open dialogue on human rights issues with the Europeans and the Americans. And from a transnational perspective, this is an important improvement because through, this, through these human rights groups discussions, both in China and the United States and, and in reaction with the government, we begin to develop a dialogue and a common understanding of human rights and the Chinese begin to buy into international standards of human rights behavior and that ultimately then is implemented in specific policy and, and laws which improve the human rights for the Chinese. So I don't want to say that that dialogue is not important. It's very important. But, but don't expect it to have a big impact anytime soon, except in maybe some specific cases. Well, that, but, but also we found that, you know, when we've imposed trade sanctions, it's hurt us as much as it's hurt them. It's hurt the people we wanted to help. Remember, when you impose trade sanctions on China, it generally hurts the, the little guy, the businessmen that want to be entrepreneurs that we want to encourage. Uh, it, it hurts other people that, that are able to consume American goods because the Chinese retaliate. And, and, and it has little effect on the government. It maybe just angers them and provokes them, and, and they began to take an attitude that, look, you know, don't, don't dictate to us what to do. We don't dictate to you, so don't dictate to us. Respect our sovereignty. And, and that's a major issue of contention all the time in U.S.-China relations. They see us as using human rights as leverage
to destabilize China and to undermine the government, not as some uh, altruistic effort to improve the lot of the, chi- of the average Chinese citizen, but rather a very devious effort to undermine the government and overthrow communism. And they react very violently to it. I mean, violently in the sense of angrily, not just killing people. Okay. So maybe I've talked you into the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you.